Today's guest built a software company before shifting to multifamily. He's currently focused on 150 to 250 unit assets in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. I'd like to welcome Cody Littlewood. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Where did you start? Did you get right into multifamily? So uh, I think, as you mentioned, I, I built a software company from my kitchen table to, uh, I don't know, 75, 80 employees or something like that. Along the way, I kind of started to feel that the business income, I, I was making really great income, but I kind of felt like the business income was a little flighty. And I looked at, you know, my family and realized business cash flows always feel a little less permanent than, uh, you know, than cash flow from assets. Kind of started looking around at what I could do to diversify my family family's income in case something were to ever happen to me. I came across a podcast, really dove into housing in general. We're all building businesses here. It's good to get your insights on, you know, how the big guys do it and, you know, where they stumble. I would say they succeed out of pure momentum like in spite of themselves. Most of these large organizations are so broken. If they didn't have 500 tons moving in one direction, <laughs> uh, they would just, they would fall apart. Cool. So you, you started to get into multifamily in the Southeast. You know, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. So I partnered up with somebody that I met that had already done some real estate investing before. Uh, we started with a, what we thought was going to be a flip. We were supposed to buy it for $160,000. We were supposed to put $100,000 into it, which seemed like plenty of money for a, you know, 2000 square foot house. Long story short, you know, it was a wholesaler, no inspection. I didn't really know what I was getting into. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. And the, we got into the actual gut of the property. The walls had been stuffed with garbage and then stuccoed over. Um, oh my God. So, yeah, so we had to, long story short, but we had to rebuild about like 50% of the property, uh, you know, concrete block construction. In Miami, we have to withstand hurricanes. And so, uh, yeah. So we refinanced and held on to it. And now I'm unfortunately the owner of a single family home I want nothing to do with. Um, <laughs> and so that was my foray. That was my first investment. It did not go well, but I learned a lot of lessons than that one. I think the number one lesson was probably to have, you know, to not be anxious to deploy capital. I just wanted okay. to do a deal. I hadn't really built out an underwriting process. And that was a, I was in a, a you know, not a, I didn't lose any money. Um, so it was, yeah. I won't say it's an, it was an expensive deal, but uh, certainly didn't make any money. Um, just trying to, you know, trying to do a deal and not right. really, not really being patient. So coming out of that, what, what was your morale like? Did you not want to do any more real estate or were you determined to do it the right way? My next one went incredibly well. Definitely, I learned a lot of lessons and the next one went incredibly well. I was looking at like my cash flow from these two properties and it was like a couple hundred bucks a month or something like that. Yeah. You know, small homes are like really hard to, hard to scale, you know? I mean, yeah. I was trying to replace a significant amount of income. It was going to take me a really long time to get there. Honestly, I didn't know that there were private Private equity options out there at the time. If, if I would have known at that point, I would have just been like, screw it, I'm putting a million dollars with Mark, you know, like, and like, right. you know, yeah. then I'm going to go invest with this guy, this guy, and this guy, I'm going to find great operators. So what are you, what are the other asset classes that you invest passively in? Industrial retail. I, I really, I like both those asset classes. I also, I've been trying to do a passion project a year. So I bought a beachfront hotel this past year. It's like a oh, small awesome. boutique hotel that like, I don't know, 70,000, $80,000 a key. Uh, renovations, you know, really beautiful stuff. And then I, you know, I have some uh, software private equity investments. I'm in, you know, a few crypto funds that just kicked off after the recent crash. So we'll see how that goes. But. Did you say you've got about 150 units? Is that, is that? No, we buy 150 to 250. Oh, units. I see. Okay. Yeah. We have collectively between the three partners, we have about 1600 units. I started buying bigger and bigger stuff. I got to the point where I was like, okay, I can't do this with my own money because it's starting to get too big. And so, and, and unfortunately, I was in Rockefeller. I, I met a, a partner um, in the same organization that you and I are part of in GoBundance. He bought, you know, 1500 doors or something like that in Chicagoland. He wanted exposure to the Southeast. I wanted a partner that I would feel confident taking investors money while working with because I'd done my own stuff, but like certainly not at that scale. Right. So I hadn't gotten to the point where I was buying 150 unit apartment buildings. I was buying like 20, 40 unit apartment buildings. I partner up with him and we started buying, you know, significantly larger properties as far as I guess economic climate. And so now we own quite a bit of property. I kind of believe, I mean, certainly, you know, you mentioned the economic, you know, current economic outlook. We think that the economic outlook is certainly 
getting worse. Uh, you know, if we're not already in a recession, a recession's right around the corner. But right now, there's also it's also a really good time to make deals. Sometimes when the biggest opportunities exist, when there's a, a big split between fear and fundamentals. Right. I think fundamentals behind housing are very, very strong. Um, you know, and if, I mean, in good markets, in the right markets, growing population, growing jobs, you see housing shortages across the board. And I think that the, the, the fundamentals are still really strong. I think there will be pain. Um, but the problem is, is that everyone looks to the previous recession for what the next one's going to look like. And the next one never looks like the previous one. <laughs> right. Um, so I don't think it's going to be painful in the same ways. But, you know, yeah. I think it's, it's certainly a time to be careful and to not, you know, deals that people were doing last year, I would not be doing this year. You know, I, I don't think necessarily we were doing those deals, but I but I was seeing deals getting done that I thought last year, that doesn't make sense. And those deals are definitely not getting done this year. So. You know, and just be careful with the debt. The debt's kind of moving around. If people feel like it's bad relatively, but it's not that bad. I mean, the short end of the curve, you know, for value add guys, that's really hard, right? On the bridge, on the bridge debt. Right. But the long end of the curve still looks, I mean, historically very favorable, very low. So a trait you have that has served you best both in real estate and in life. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say delayed gratification. I mean, we live in a house that I could have bought cash. I I always have delayed gratification in my personal life, in my business. Like there were times where I could have taken massive dividends, but I pushed putting more capital on the, you know, keeping more capital on the balance sheet. What's like your biggest challenge that you're facing right now? I would say operating in the current climate with like, while keeping my cool is probably my biggest like mental challenge. I think it's hard to read macro news every day Day and keep your keep your wits about you. I do think it, it. I think it's what separates great investors from like mediocre investors. And there's so many people that I've talked to over the years, especially during bull markets, that say things like "Be greedy when others are fearful." And now that actually everyone's fearful, they're doing the same thing <laughs> as everyone else. Being a disciplined investor during times of significant market volatility and shifting, that's probably my biggest challenge right now. And like just keeping my cool in my head because it's just very uncertain times. And so I think that's a big challenge that's you know underappreciated maybe. Uh, I think understanding history makes you a better investor. I think also understanding you know, your own psychology um, is like, it makes you a really good investor too. So. And others and the- And others, and other psychology. psychology. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs>